Okay, is that good? There we go. Hi, I'm Amy Sturgis. I teach at Belmont University, and I want to thank Dolomite and all of y'all for having me back again this year. Uh, last year when I came, I talked about the history of literary science fiction. And one of the grandiose claims I made uh, during uh, that moment of mapping out how science fiction has evolved over the years is that uh, Heinlein is basically the, the king of the golden age of science fiction. Um, to give you a quick thumbnail sketch of where I went before, I basically uh, looked at the beginning of science fiction with people like Mary Shelley, Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, uh, that the science in that kind of science fiction began with biology, chemistry, and physics. And so science fiction for a long time was working on that, that premise using the kind of what if question, um, basically using the science of biology, chemistry, and physics. And that reached a certain point while also you had all the things like pulp magazines going on and the whole period where there were, you know, girls with big boobs and big guns uh, for the 14-year-old crowd uh, that sort of got, was the caricature that science fiction eventually got kind of stuck with um, was uh, still in that period. And it kind of, I think, hit its high point there with Heinlein. And then after that, the, the definition of the science in science fiction continued to change. So you had anti-science as science with Ray Bradbury. You had science as anthropology, science as linguistics, science as a whole number of different things. And so basically science fiction has expanded to a point where really science fiction is literature. And some of the best science fiction writers today, I would argue, are in the fiction section and not the science fiction section, because really the science part of science fiction has gotten so big, it can't be defined. But the best of the golden era, and by that I mean the still physics as science part of science fiction, I think is Robert Heinlein. And so now I'm trying to defend my claim this year. I'm coming back to try to to convince you that what I said is actually the truth. Uh, if you go on, say, LiveJournal right now and click in Heinlein, not Robert Heinlein or Robert A. Heinlein, but just Heinlein in the interest section, you get an interesting group of, uh, of folks showing up. You have um, some political organizations that are on LiveJournal that consider themselves the new Jacksonians. You have people who like science fiction. You even have uh, some swingers communities looking to swipe spouses with you. Uh, right now, the people who consider themselves to be Heinleinian uh, run the gamut from people, you know, freaked out astrologers to very cool and rational astronomers. Uh, there are um, anarchists and very conservative folk. There are very staunch uh, atheists, and there are people in the church of all worlds that consider Robert Heinlein a prophet and his book, Stranger in a Strange Land, a holy book. They kind of go all over the spectrum, and uh, that's, that says a lot about the person who sort of, you know, engendered uh, that kind of reaction and has... You know, his book's been written uh, and published over half a century ago. So who is Robert Heinlein? Uh, Heinlein was born in 1907. Uh, he lived a very long life and published up through the end of it and actually published after his death. Several of his works were posthumous. Uh, he was a Navy man. He went to Annapolis. Uh, he was trained in the military, served as long as he possibly could before... Uh, being uh, discharged as being uh, permanently disabled because of uh, tuberculosis. Uh, and he ended up being ill basically on and off for the rest of his life. This is important though, his Navy training, because a lot of military themes and military ideas and notions of discipline, notions of defense, come back over and over again in his works. Uh, and the one that everyone points to there is Starship Troopers. Um, also known as the movie that made Doogie Howser a jackbooted thug. Uh, but we'll talk, about, uh, we'll talk about Starship Troopers a little more later. But um, 
his, his naval training actually had a great impact on his work uh, and his notions of hierarchy, too. He was trained in the sciences. He actually served uh, as an engineer in aircraft design during World War II and on and off again did different uh, kinds of work either with, um, with engineering or with uh, telecommunications uh, in his life. This, too, is important because the science in his science fiction was real. He was known for stopping in the middle of a good action sequence and explaining why the ship was doing what it was doing, how those things it was firing were actually working, uh, and he could do that. People that were his contemporaries, like Ray Bradbury, uh, basically did a technobabble thing. Uh, they made a funny word, they'll, assuming that the reader would take their word for it and moved on. Um, and really almost were kind of flippant about the science. But Heinlein knew it, and he knew it intimately, and he wanted to share. And so that, uh, that came across in his writing as well. Uh, he sold his first story. Basically, he had uh, gotten out of the military. He had been working different kinds of jobs um, and saw that there was a magazine that had a short story contest. And it seemed to him that that was doing really well, uh, that would be a great idea to do because it would be quick money and he could write, anybody could write, you just you know, put one word after another. So he wrote his story, um, but by the time he was done with it, he was so pleased with it that he didn't send it into the contest, he sent it in to one of the better magazines, um, Astounding Science Fiction, which was very hot at the time, uh, was the, actually the leading, uh, leading magazine in its area and sold it for twice as much as he would have made had he won the contest. And pretty much from then on out, he was a writer. Uh, he made his money by writing for the rest of his life. One story, he was hooked. Something else important I should mention, um, the picture here is, is Heinlein with his third wife, Virginia. Uh, the first two marriages ended rather quickly, and then, uh, then he married Virginia, and that's a very important thing as well. Um, I'll mention later his uh, lost book that was just published this year. Uh, people say that the importance of the book is, to, is showing how his writing was before he married Virginia because clearly she had a very deep impact on the themes in his novels and uh, you can really see a before and after shot there. So the other important thing in his life was his wife. Uh, I'm not really pulling stuff out of thin air when I say he's he's the king of the golden age. And in fact, if, if you had to pick someone to explain to someone what uh, science fiction is, you would grab a book by Heinlein. Um, I have been backed up by, uh, by a lot of folks in this. And here are some of the awards that he's won. And they're very, it, it's important to see all the different areas um, that really recognized him. I'm just hitting a couple of the big ones here. He won uh, really... Uh, too many awards to, to go through uh, for this talk. But the Hugo Awards, named for Hugo Gernsback, uh, who created the word scientific fiction, uh, putting scientific and fiction together, which was the prototype then for science fiction. Uh, the Hugo Awards are voted on by readers every year. Uh, and they started there in 1950, and he won four of them for Double Star, Starship Troopers, Stranger in a Strange Land, and The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Um, that's a very serious adult uh, award to win. Uh, and it also shows that there's a lot of attention from the readership, and obviously that the fact that he covered a 16-year period there is also significant. I say it's an adult award to win because one of the other awards he won was the Sequoia Award uh, for Best Novel for Young Readers. That's voted on by children, actually children in the state of Oklahoma, my home state. Uh, and the book was also nominated for a Hugo, not for a Hugo for young adult fiction, a Hugo for adult fiction. Uh, and Have Space Suit Will Travel is basically one of the standard works. And it's very difficult to figure out who the intended reading audience is because it's such a successful work. But clearly you can see he, uh, both readerships recognized him. When the Hugo Awards began, they immediately started getting retro awards for uh, works that came too early. 
uh, that couldn't have been considered for the Hugo Awards, and he won three of them for works in just one year, and they covered the gamut novel, novella, and dramatic presentation for Destination Moon, which is considered to be the first modern science fiction movie. So you can see he moved across multiple genres there. And again, the fans were watching slash reading. Uh, when Apollo 11 landed on the moon, they invited Heinlein to be the one who gave the guest commentary to basically tell the story to listeners and viewers. Uh, so he was the voice of the space program in that sense uh, to an entire generation of, of uh of viewers and listeners. When the Nebula Awards began, those are voted on by the Science Fiction Writers Association. They're the opposite of the Hugos. The Hugos mean you're popular with the readers. Uh, the Nebulas mean that you're popular with your, your cohorts, your colleagues. Other writers think you're a great writer. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that the one is the other. Um, if it's popular, sometimes it's considered to be crap. So the fact that he could be both popular and critically acclaimed is significant. When they began uh, the Nebulas, uh, Heinlein was given the very first Grandmaster Award for Lifetime Achievement. Three other of his works were nominated for both Hugos and Nebulas. So again, you've got both the critical acclaim and the popular acclaim. Uh, Time Enough for Love, Friday, and Job, A Comedy of Justice. He has also been the inspiration for seven films, most recently the really awful Starship Troopers and its straight-to-video sequel. Uh, and there are three more currently in development. Um, one is Stranger in a Strange Land. And I know the last thing they were talking about with that was Tom Hanks. I don't know where that is, but that's been on the board. Um, that's a dreadful miscasting, but that's, uh, that's what's happening. Um, but it might get people to read the book, like Peter Jackson and J.R.R. Tolkien. And uh, they're also looking at, actually, I can't remember which um, uh, production company has gotten the rights to Moon is a Harsh Mistress, but that's another that's, uh, that's kind of on the table. Two television series, one of them animated, uh, spun out of works that Heinlein wrote, um, a mini-series, a video game. So again, his influence is stretched across different media. And this year, for us, The Living, the lost novel I mentioned before that shows the pre-Virginia Heinlein uh, was published and became a bestseller. Uh, so again, he's still very much in the debate today. Why? If I had to explain this man's incredible popularity, uh, which I hope that I've just convinced you of with all of these examples, why is Heinlein so great? Great in every sense of the word, not just great as in fantastic, but great as in looming large, really dominating um, the history of the genre. Several reasons, I would say. This is, this is the gospel according to Amy. Uh, first, he used really hard science fiction um, to explore what it means to be human. What do I mean by that? On the one hand, his science was real science. He bought into the notion that Hugo Gernsback began the whole notion of science fiction with that really science fiction should draw people in, make them want to know more science, make them students of science regardless of their age, and allow them to see how scientific principles applied would change the world. So in that sense, he was a hard science fiction writer. But the questions he asked weren't technological questions. He used a very technological means of telling his story, but the questions he asked were very universal, abstract questions. What should the state look like? What should our relationships be with each other? Is monogamy an accident of history that we will outgrow? Is authority something to which we should submit? What does the good life look like? All of these big questions about who we are, how we should live our lives, and how we should be uh, related to each other were the things that interested him. So he used a science fiction way of getting there, but 
uh, he was speaking to a much larger audience, and I think that's really important. That's why I can use Heinlein when I teach colonial American history, which I do. Um, that's why I can use Heinlein when I teach uh, Western history and the history of manifest destiny, because I do. Uh, I use Heinlein in a whole lot of ways. Um, I've seen Heinlein taught in philosophy classes. There's a reason for that. He's not just telling you how the ship moves and how the gun is firing, although he does that too. But he's also talking about really big things. A second reason I think he's king is that he brought his message to young people um, without talking down to them. Uh, and so he created science fiction readers for a lifetime. If I had to make a parallel today, I'd use Neil Gaiman for uh, the fantasy genre, the way um, books like Coraline speak to young people, and then they can turn right around and read The Sandman, and then they can turn right around and read American Gods or Neverwhere, and they're set for life. No matter how old they get, they've got something to read. The same was true of Heinlein. And this is important because Heinlein was kind of coming of age, literarily, in the time of the pulp magazines that paid people by the word, so they were really well motivated to write really badly, very quickly, and keep churning out formula things. And so uh, there was a good argument to be made that young people were being uh, written down to. And he actually... Uh, was speaking to them on a much higher level and creating science fiction readers for life. He offered uh, another reason, challenging perspectives on all aspects of human life, including society and politics. And when I say challenging, I mean, uh, when you read his work, you didn't say, wow, he's thinking ahead. He's looking five or ten years, you know, into what the future will look like. No. The stuff he wrote in 1960 that seemed way out, in 2004, still seemed way out. Uh, and that really goes in the face of a lot of the social things that we as kind of a Western society hold together. And I will explain this more in detail with my case studies. Um, it uh, at, makes readers question some very fundamental assumptions. And it keeps doing that. He keeps doing that. And because of that, I think he's endured uh, as a writer and as a, basically a, one of the pillars of the genre. Uh, and last, he provided a worldview that is still relevant and fresh today. Um, a lot of, of authors who seem very dated um, were not asking really big questions, and he was. And so he doesn't seem dated. And so people reading his work today still find it interesting and applicable. Now... I'd like to move on and give a couple of case studies of, of what I just said in really broad terms. The easy thing to do would be to look at um, Have Spacesuit Will Travel because it was such a popular book, but uh, there's a chance that you might already be exposed to it. And secondly, uh, there's a book that's my favorite that I'm going to talk about, and that's Pod Cain of Mars, as an example of bringing science fiction to the young. Podcane of Mars, what's this story about? It's a story about a young girl, an adolescent girl, and her really bratty younger brother who have parents who both work all the time and don't really care. Their parents have uh, basically baby embryos in the fridge that they're eventually going to thaw out and have more babies, but they don't really have time for the two that they have already. Uh, eventually they realize, well, they're really need to go ahead and pop these two other babies in and, and go ahead and have them. So they basically microwave the, uh, the uh, embryos, go ahead and have the babies, and there's really just not enough attention to go around. So Pod Kane and her brother basically get shipped off on their uncle. Okay, and his, Their uncle is a star-traveling politician, and he's going on a trip, and he's very glad to take them along. And he's very lenient and lets them go and do all sorts of things. But he's a great guide because he knows his way around the galaxy. And uh, he's kind of, you know, the nice uncle everybody would want, or so it seems. Pod Kane is trying to figure out who she is and what she wants out of life because she thinks she'd really like to be the captain of a starship. But... She also likes babies and boys. And so what if she ended up falling in love and getting married and having children? 
what's amazing to me about this is that Heinlein, okay, who at this point is in his 50s, writes incredibly convincingly from the point of view of an adolescent girl. And the fact that this adolescent girl happens to be worrying about how the engine on the ship works, because if she were a captain, she'd need to know those kinds of things. So she's fascinated by every sort of you know, red alert they have, what's going wrong, what's going right. Um, but she's also asking questions that all girls ask themselves, or all siblings ask themselves, if they have a bratty little brother or sister who's pestering the daylights out of them. The fact that he can write like that is really amazing and speak immediately to a young reader. But the fact that he has that internal dialogue going on doesn't change the fact he's still asking really big questions. Uh, Podcane, or Potty, as she likes to be called, um, finds out that there's a lot of crap going on in the universe, and actually her uncle might be part of it. When they go to one planet, he explains that the way the planet is set up is either the grimmest tyranny or the most perfect democracy ever devised. And she has to go and figure that out. What does that world look like? Let me read just a paragraph. This is, this is Potty herself talking about the planet uh, on which she's found herself. Not that I understand it. I don't understand anything about this, how this planet really works. No laws, just corporate regulations. Want to get married? Find somebody who claims to be a priest or a preacher and have any ceremony you like, but it hasn't any legal standing because it's not a contract with the corporation. Want a divorce? Pack your clothes. Leave as quickly as you can. Illegitimacy, they've never heard of it. A baby is a baby and the corporation won't let them do without because the baby will grow up and be an employee. And Venus has a chronic labor shortage. Polygamy, polyandry, who cares? The corporation doesn't. This isn't, you know, see spot run. She's trying to figure out the way the economics on the planet affect the social organization on the planet the government of the planet, whether this is good or bad, how she feels about where she is, but he's not writing down to the reader. He's playing something out and making the reader basically grow up to his intellectual level. Um, and that's pretty sophisticated stuff. As Potty goes on, she finds out that um, her uncle uh, you know, has a few problems the fact that he's a politician has led him to do some things that perhaps weren't so great. Puts her and her brother in uh, a lot of danger. She's also coming to terms with who she is and what she wants. And uh, the, the longer the story goes on, the more you really love her. At the end of the story, <clears throat> Heinlein does something really unusual. He kills her. Uh, this girl that you've come to really love. Now, the very first novel that he put out, they wouldn't allow him to have the ending he wanted, uh, and he had to wait and do the next publication, the ending that, that he liked. Recently, there was actually a, a, a publication that came out that allowed people to vote on whether the first ending or Heinlein's real ending uh, was the best, but people are really compelled by the ending he leaves us with, with... Uh, Potty, after she's seen all of these things in the universe that aren't really all that great, uh, dies because after saving her brother, she goes back to save a little animal creature that she had adopted. And she leaves a little last message when she knows that she's going to die. And uh, her brother, the very last bit of the book is from her brother's point of view, trying to figure out then what he's going to do after kind of having a life-changing experience of watching her. Um, watching what she had done, how she had saved him, and the fact that she died. When asked why he did this, this is what Heinlein said. Quote, I could state that the theme of the story is that death is the only destination for all of us, and the only long-range hope for any adult lies in the young, and that this double realization constitutes growing up, ceasing to be a child, and putting away childish things. But I can't say it that baldy, baldly, not in fiction. And it seemed to me that I needed Potty's death to say it at all. If Potty gets to have her cake and eat it too, marriage and star roving, if that little monster, her brother, gets off unscathed to continue his clever but asocial career, 
If their mother gets away with neglecting her children's rearing without having a backfire on her, then the story is just a series of mildly adventurous incidents strung together. He had a plan even for his juvenile fiction, and he wrote a lot of juvenile fiction. And where some people considered that all of science fiction was just a series of mildly adventurous events, mildly str or, uh, strung together, he wanted even the stories that were to appeal to 12-year-olds to really be saying something about the human condition. And they said something about, you know, space flight. And they said something about life on other planets. But it said something about what it meant, in this case, to grow up and to come to grips with mortality. And that's a really significant, significant thing. Another reason that uh, Heinlein should be considered uh, a king, I think, is that he wrestled with those issues, those societal issues that probably will always be issues to us, um, those of uh, gender and race and how we're supposed to relate to each other and what all of this means. Stranger in a Strange Land, as I mentioned before, is considered a religious text today by the Church of All Worlds. But it's also come into our mainstream vocabulary in a lot of ways. Just the phrase, Stranger in a Strange Land, shows up all over the place in speeches, in conversation. Huh, you should have seen me when I went to X. I was a stranger in a strange land. Um, if you remember the... I grok Spock movement. I have a vintage I grok Spock pen that's actually older than I am that I think is very cool. Uh, but it comes out again every so often in different ways. The verb grok is, is referring back to Heinlein. So as much as that is I grok Spock, a pro Star Trek statement, it's also a pro Heinlein statement. The gist of Stranger in a Strange Land is that a human left on Mars by the original Martian uh, uh, group from Earth that went to colonize Mars, um, that died, leaving him the child of two of its members, the only human on Mars, is raised by Martians. What happens to him when they find him, when other Earthlings go to Mars to try to colonize again and find, oops, there's still one Earthman there, actually one who is born on Mars, who is more Martian than human, and they bring him back to Earth. What happens? In this case, it's almost a messianic situation where this human who's been uncorrupted by humanity tries to teach the world what being a Martian, and in turn, what being a human really is. And one of the keys to that is the verb grokking that, uh, that I mentioned that Heinlein created. This is a Heinleinism. Grokking, it means alternately understanding, loving, cherishing, hating, um, dealing with in any possible way. And it was a revelation in the sense that it meant appealing to a higher consciousness. The drug culture loved grokking. They thought if you smoked and swallowed things, you could grok in an even better way. And perhaps they're right. Uh, but grokking became part, again, of the terminology of the entire culture. One of the things that um, Valentine Michael Smith, the Martian human, brought to Earth was the notion of the nest. Actually, if you do a search on Heinlein, uh, do a Google search, you'll find there are a lot of nests still around all these years later that are trying to um, recapture the promise of what Heinlein described. The nest was a sort of communist way of organizing, a sort of um, love-in kind of way of organizing, sort of a commune way of organizing. For a bunch of people who really liked each other in every way possible it was to like each other, lived together, shared their resources, uh, and lived in sort of an utopian kind of existence. Uh, the description of the quote-unquote churches that um, were created around uh, the stranger in the strange land, around Michael. Um, there's multiple families living together, um, a free love kind of thing. There was marriage, but in, the, in marriage, uh, it was just a certain affinity. People 
basically um, swapped spouses all the time. People didn't need to be married at all. They shared money. In fact, there's a great description of a big barrel where there's money at the door and people grab what they need when they leave and throw it back in when they come, uh, come back. Uh, large beds, large kitchens, and everything else worked really well. But one of the ideas of the nest was that everyone there was involved with learning how to use all aspects of themselves, including their brain. And so people who came to the nest to live, who were water brothers with each other, um, were able to do things like uh, telepathic communication and um, teleportation, things that seem very supernatural, very exiles, were actually things humans could do all along and just never had. Control their bodies to the degree that they didn't have to sleep for days on end, or they could quiet their heart rate and slow down their metabolism. Grow their hair instantly if they wished, if they fought it into existence. This wasn't new stuff, this was stuff we always could do, but never had unlocked the potential for. So the lifestyle that he was describing was experimental in many, many ways. Um, there's something really challenging and frightening and uh, freaky about all of this. And there's also something to be said uh, for the fact that basically one of the climactic, pun intended, um, uh, scenes in the entire novel is uh, when the really, really old guy, the mentor figure, finally gets to have sex with the cute stripper girl. And all the rest of the people in the family in the nest get to get inside her, her, her head and experience the sex too. So basically everybody's loving him at the same time in every way humanly possible, or inhumanly possible, depending on how you look at it. Uh, this was really big for 1961. It's really big when you read it now in 2004. The idea of what all of the changes would mean socially, economically, politically, as we, because of the example of this one Martian, change the entire way we live. There's a great conversation when um, the, the stranger in a strange land basically says, this is going to change the way everything works. There's a little paragraph here I'll read. Um, how can a teacher handle a child who knows more than she does? What becomes of physicians when people are always healthy? What happens to the cloak and the suit industry when clothing isn't necessary and we aren't so engrossed in dressing up? And nobody gives a damn if he's caught with his arse bear. What shape does the farm problem have when weeds can be told not to grow and crops can be harvested without benefit of any machinery. Just name it, the discipline changes it beyond recognition. Take one change that will shake both marriage in its present form and property. The idea that unlocking the potential of the human mind would really change everything uh, was a part of this, and hence this is one of his uh, best known works. And another thing Heinlein did was openly challenge traditional religion. Um, the basic teaching that comes out of Stranger in a Strange Land is thou art God. Thou art God, I am God. Everyone is God. Now, in some sense, this seems really trite, and it sounds like you know something that you would hear on Oprah in the afternoon, but actually it comes from something much deeper. And th the fact that the Stranger in a Strange Land basically sets himself up in a church basically to tell people that they don't need a church is very, very Heinleinian. And again, something that really seems outside the boundary of what we would normally think of as golden age science fiction, right? People with big guns and big ships. Interestingly enough, a lot of the things he tackles we are amazed at later when Ursula Le Guin in Left Hand of Darkness starts taking on gender. It's a really amazing thing. And yet he was asking the same questions a lot earlier. He was just uh, going about them in a very different way. And my favorite, the way Heinlein used really great science and science fiction to talk about politics. My favorite work, and what I think is his greatest work, is The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Um, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress, the premise is basically 
a revisitation of the American Revolution, except instead of a group of colonies on one continent rebelling against a country in another, you have people living on the moon rebelling against the control of Earth. People on the moon who didn't necessarily want to be there, much like the American colonists, uh, some were shipped there because they were poor, many were shipped there because they were convicts, wasn't really the greatest uh, means of, in the world of colonizing the place. But once it is colonized, these people create a world for themselves and they want to break free. A lot of things we don't really think of in the first uh, blush about a book like this because we're thinking people go to the moon, people live there, people find ways of farming, of creating uh, indoor habitation a lot of the political aspects of it. Ken Staffel, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, comes from the moon as a harsh mistress. The idea that people have to pay in one sense or another for everything they get. And in that sense, Earth has to pay for what it gets from the moon. The idea that there are competing means of law, that the law that works for Earth doesn't work for the moon. And the, the loonies, as they call themselves, um, create their own law that really does work. Uh, in this sense, pretty much going back to sort of a comparative legal structures, decentralized thing. A lot of people call this the great libertarian epic. They call it um, the uh, Atlas Shrugged of science fiction because it's uh, very individualistic and very um, anti-authoritarian. Uh, the idea that basically some things that people, particularly in the United States, would like to think works everywhere, doesn't necessarily work everywhere. Maybe some, one of those messages we need to keep getting by reading the book over and over again, uh, reading it in new eras with new political realities. Another thing interesting that he does is uh, project how technology is going to impact um, very personal things. The line marriage that he describes in uh, Moon is a Harsh Mistress is again something that really challenges us even today. The idea that you would have a polygamous relationship with people, um, not a man with two wives, but maybe 12 spouses of different generations, that you could opt into a marriage, man or woman, at a certain age, and have basically an entire family that does a lot of things, including protect uh, property rights, in a situation where property rights are really in flux that would give people motivation for working one farm uh, against really incredible odds or working one factory or working one um, oxygen or, or water plant uh, for the long term because all of these things would remain in the family, in the marriage. One of the most striking things about Moon is a Harsh Mistress is when one of the, uh, the loonies is brought back to Earth to explain the, Earth, uh, the, the Moon's position, uh, a picture of his family, of his husbands and wives, slips out. And it goes to the press. And he later figures out that the reason that he's thrown in jail for being in a lying marriage isn't that he's offended people's sensibilities by having more than one spouse so much as it is that the spouses are different colors. Again, something that comes back, uh, Heinlein talking about issues that really need to be kind of taken up in many, in many senses, something much larger than science fiction, although he spends a lot of time on the science fiction aspects of things, which brings us to Mike, one of the great characters uh, in science fiction. Mike is artificial intelligence. He basically starts out as just a computer and is tinkered with to the point that uh, he's really AI. Uh, and then he is tinkered with to the point that he's a she or it's he, is, he is a he and a she. He takes on all aspects of, uh, of human consciousness, including sort of a gendered personality, depending on when you talk to him. Um, and he ends up being the general that coordinates the entire revolution. He's the ultimate nonpartisan political leader. And Mike runs uh, the entire lunar rebellion against Earth. Uh, an incredibly human character and questioning what does it mean to be human and what does the, the engineer um, who basically 
unpacked in every sense of the word, all things uh, to the degree that might could be created and then could be liberated. Um, what does he think of his creation when the creation is the one who's teaching him? So uh, really in this sense kind of anticipating things like neuromancer and things that would come later, uh, you know, all the good, uh, the good stuff, do androids dream of electric sheep? What does it mean to be human when the technology seems a lot more human than we are? So uh, a great way of pulling all of that together. So I think these three basically are great examples of the things that make Heinlein uh, great science fiction and timeless science fiction and that show how using the technological lens actually creates questions that are much bigger than, uh, than the non-technological folk would actually appreciate. It's just a means of asking very big questions about what it means to be human. So with that, I will rest my case and see if, oh, I'm sorry, no, actually I've got one more thing. And that is, are there any Heinleins today? Because obviously Heinlein hasn't written anything in 20 years, although we did luck out and get some of his posthumous publications. I would say yes, kind of. I would say if I had to pick someone, it would be Lois McMaster Bougeau. She just this year beat his record for um, Hugo wins. She hasn't caught up with him in terms of Nebula uh, nominations, and certainly there's no way to beat someone from being the first Nebula Grandmaster. But uh, she has won a great number of awards. Um, although she's now starting to write in fantasy, I don't really know what that's going to mean. But her Vorkosigan series, which has, what, 14 books in its series, uh, does a lot of the things that Heinlein did best uh, in his short stories and in his, his uh, novels. Basically, what seems to be an impossible thing, writing feminist, military, hard science fiction with a focus on questions that seem very much humanities. Really big order for anybody to meet, but she happens to do it as well. Um, her work basically creates a universe where uh, different governmental slash political slash economic systems have ended up on different planets. And so the planets are metaphors for different countries. Um, her hard science fiction is not the same kind of hard SF that, that Heinlein wrote. Um, you're in a ship and you know it works uh, and that's good because nobody's dying because it thing isn't falling apart, but you don't really know how it works. But she does do hard sci-fi. She uh, can explain in detail, for example, what the uterine replicator does to allow um, basically newly fertilized uh, eggs, new embryos to be transplanted into these great uterine replicators so that all humans basically get to have very safe, uh, very um, uh, environmentally controlled uh, gestation periods. Plus, the parents can go off and party for nine months and then come back to the kid when it's ready to pop out of the out of the machine. Um, she can explain things like that. She's more she's very good with things like cloning, cloning in the sense of human beings and what this means, but cloning also in the sense of organs and organ replacement. She's much more biology in that sense. She's much more Mary Shelley than she is H.G. Wells or Jules Verne, but. Her commentary is about the larger issues um, in the same way that Heinlein's were. Um, what, what are you know, appropriate and good ways to live, uh, finding things like mates. She also brings up the issues of monogamy and um, transsexuality and those sorts of things, uh, of authority uh, and the relationship between the individual and the community and what laws should look like and what competing le legal systems would lead to if left uh, to natural selection in that sense. Um, and in a way, she shares a lot of Heinlein's assumptions. Uh, she also has a certain libertarianness to her writing um, that I think would be amenable to um, the best of Heinlein's work. But there are some ways that even she, who's done so much, just isn't a Heinlein. Heinlein wrote a lot of great essays uh, that sort of illuminated issues uh, that he found in his fiction. She doesn't write nonfiction. 
Um, one of the big things is that she doesn't write for a younger audience. Heinlein could grow his own crop of science fiction readers and then catch them in different phases of their lives. Um, with Rougeau, you just hope they're already there as adults. Uh, but she doesn't have that kind of young adult, juvenile uh, writing record in the same way that Heinlein did. Uh, the reason I didn't list all of Heinlein's works is because I'd still be listing them if I tried today. Literally, just mind-boggling amounts of, of work. It's great that, that Bougeot's written you know, 14 books, 16 if you count her two non again. sorry, 17. Um, uh, but she's nowhere near as prolific as he was at her age. So it's a humbling thing to be compared to Heinlein. Um, but the fact that she doesn't have that doesn't mean that she isn't sort of an inheritor of his. Um, so I won't say they don't make them like they used to, I'll just say they make them slightly differently. But with that, I will rest my case about Heinlein and say that uh, certainly his um, legacy lives on. And so I hope you'll let me get by with calling him the king of the golden age of science fiction. And I thank you. felt like I was back in my undergraduate science fiction class, and I just had to, having read him extensively like I think a lot of us have, which do you think are his crappiest works, just out of curiosity? Because when uh -huh. you're prolific, you're going to hit some clinkers. <laughs> well, that's, that is, that's a very good question. Um, and when I said I, I thought his greatest work was um, uh, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, it was tough because there's so many. Ask about his crappiest work, it's tough because there's so many. <laughs> Um, no, one of the problems was that, that, uh, that as he got older, uh, he, he felt less and less um, necessity to really hold things together in the narrative the way he did earlier. Uh, and he, because he created this sort of future history series that you could follow certain characters through certain, you know, so many in incarnations, I think at some point he had trouble differentiating the characters for himself. Um, so... Uh, Oh, gosh, you know, by the time he's doing a lot of the later Lazarus Long stuff, I think it gets pretty out there. Um, yeah, yeah, it's t not only tough to follow, but you really don't have a lot of motivation to follow it. Um, I wonder if he had been well, and if he at that point, uh, at that point I think he was suffering from J.K. Rowling's disease, if you could say J.K. Rowling has any disease, which doesn't seem like it. Um, but... Uh, the editors didn't want to touch him because, my God, he was Heinlein, right? And, uh, you know, he could have benefited from that a little more. But um, I'm glad we have the crappy stuff. But I think some of the later, the later works, um, I'm catty walk through walls. I mean, I'm just thinking of some things that were, you know, <laughs> that I'd be less likely to reread than I would. I'd still put his work against other people's for the sense of making us think. Um, he actually destroyed his copies of For Us the Living and tried to do his best to destroy any copies existing so people couldn't read it. And if you read it as a Heinlein book, you say, wow, that was kind of, that was tough going. That didn't flow. But if you, you know, pick up whatever's in the airport under the science fiction section and read it, um, going by the definition, what is science fiction, anything that's in the science fiction section of the, of the bookstore, uh, I'd put it, I'd still put it against that any day. So um, that may say something just about the kind of farm industry that has certain publishers shooting out works that are just as formula as the you know big boob big gun um, juveniles of the 19 late 1940s. Uh, but but yeah, his work varies in quality at times, and certainly the ones that were written later, um, his last books. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll try to inspire more tomorrow night with my sexy nerds talk. That's the PowerPoint you want to be here for, Lee. I think that's the, um, the lecture version of foreplay before the hacker hookup afterwards. So I'll do my best to be the good opening act for that.
And there's, uh, and there's mind control in between the two. See, it all fits together. You get the sexy nerds, mind control. Who knows who you'll leave with? But Heinlein would say it doesn't really matter, right? Um, thank you very much for your time and attendance. I appreciate it.